So I did a quick uh, 180 here and uh, took a lot of it out of my presentation. So I won't rehash it for you guys. Um, I'll take a little bit of a different direction. Everything will be in a stepwise progression when I'm presenting to you guys. It'll be like building blocks, all leading up to Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans and uh, also uh, Helix Vibrance as well. As uh, Rob mentioned here, I'm just, I like moving around the room a bit, so hopefully the camera guy can keep up to me here. Um, as you can tell, I'm not built for stealth, so uh, he should have no problem. My background is actually 12 years research and development with Syngenta. So a lot of these products I'm going to talk to you about, I actually had the pleasure of developing them or indirectly working with the product. So I've got a fairly good feel for them. Uh, my presentation will basically try to provoke some thought from you guys as well on the seed care side of things. So what I'm going to do here is, a bit of a seed care buff guy. So here's a question for you guys. By a show of hands, seed treatments have been used back as far as the Roman Empire. True, show of hands. False. The answer is true. Beer, <laughs> Romans liked their beer, and they wanted to protect that barley so they didn't get bunt. Okay, so believe it or not, they actually did use beer, or sorry, uh, seed treatments. So when you're looking at a seed treatment, what are the, some of the things you should be uh, <coughs> looking at for components of seed quality? Okay, and this doesn't matter if it's wheat, barley, extrapolates to all crops, soybeans, for example, corn, all the different seeds out there. Physical mechanical damage, you don't want that. Disease, try to keep it as low as possible on that seed. Seed germination, you want good germination, you want good vigor. Frost damage, not a good thing to have. Sprouting, try to avoid that as well. Heating and glyphosate. Now I threw this up here, the reason I threw it up here is because I've heard this often that if you seed early, you need a seed treatment. If you seed late, don't worry about it, you don't need a seed treatment. The reason I threw this up here is to show the interaction between the different pathogens and where you'll see them in the spring, for example. So let's look at Pythium. Pythium likes moisture, cool temperatures. Typically you'll see that early in the spring, usually the first week of May, end of April, maybe even the second week of May, rear its ugly head. Then all of a sudden you're going to transition into Fusarium rhizoctonia. As soon as you get uh, warmer temperatures, mid-May, end of May, beginning of June, that's where you'll see these other pathogens start to rear its ugly head. So just keep in mind that whether you're seeding early or late, you're going to have different spectrum of pathogens attacking your seed or seedlings. So it's always a good idea to uh, use a seed treatment. I threw this up here because I farm as well. And um, I looked at it from a farmer's perspective. What do you want from a seed treatment? Okay, number one, performance value, efficacy, disease protection, increased yield at the end of the day. You want to see an ROI on your investment. Seed safety is another big one, for example. Emergence, carryover. With our products with Syngenta, if you don't use the treated seed this year, you can use it next year. There's 12-month seed carryover or seed safety for that data. You pay a lot of money for the seed, and you pay a lot of money for the seed treatment. That doesn't mean at the end of the seeding year, you should throw it out. Store it in a good bin, you can use it again the following year, okay? The only thing that I encourage everybody to do is if you do that, get it retested again, just to make sure nothing's wonky's going on with that seed when it was in storage. <laughs> Inoculant compatibility. A lot of seed treatments out there have come a long way in terms of improved inoculant compatibility. Tank mix compatibility. This as well, water-based formulations have improved the compatibility a lot, allowing you to mix two or three or some more products together. Where the old solvent-based products, you cracked open the cap, the vapor almost knocked you out. Or if you happen to basically get some of the solvent or those older formulations uh, accidentally drip on your foot, your hand, you're pretty much tattooed for life. It didn't come off very easy, okay? Water-based formulations are a lot more user-friendly this way in terms of cleaning them off surfaces and um, also tank mixing different things with them. 
Any questions up to this point? Perfect. So like I said, my, I took out a good chunk of my agronomy on soybeans here because I heard Dave went through a lot of the stuff. So what I did was I threw uh, basically a stepwise progression of some of the different products you'll probably see or, for example, what Pioneer will be offering on their seed in terms of on their canola seed as well as on their uh, soybeans. So Cruiser Max Vibrant Cereals, that's the next evolution in seed treatments that we have for Syngenta. And what's the difference? The Vibrance component. That's the trade name for the new active ingredient called Sidoxane. Now what does Sidoxane bring to the table or that uh, Cruiser Max Cereals didn't bring to the table before? We used to have a three-legged chair, I'd call it, okay? You used to have disease protection, insect protection, and the vigor effect, okay, with just regular Cruiser Max cereals. As soon as you add the vibrance component to it, you bring that fourth leg to that stool, so it's a little bit more sturdy. It's the rooting power component to it, okay? And I'll get into a little bit more background here going forward about it. So, like I mentioned before, the active ingredient in vibrance is called sodoxane. What does sodoxane mean to you guys? Okay. Well, it's the next evolution in seed treatments. It's called, the fancy name is SDHI chemistry. That's the enzyme that it targets basically in the metabolic pathway of the plant. Okay. It's a group seven. Okay. The key thing to know is that it translocates and it works very quickly. Okay. Now, as you can see here, Trizols, strobilurons, and then the SDHIs are coming after, okay? This is a real snazzy snapshot of what the product looks like when you carbon-14 it in terms of how it translocates. You can see wheat on the left-hand side, your left-hand side, and on your right-hand side, soy. Okay, just looks how it, or just shows how it translocates and mobility. The other thing, that Sidoxane or Vibrance brings to the table that we were lacking is smut control, okay? We were lacking smut control, true loose smut in particular, okay? That was the gap for us in barley was true loose smut. This fills the gap. You can see here on the right hand side, Cruiser Max Sierra's, all the smutted heads. And if you're driving by a field, for example, doing 100 kilometers an hour, you look over and you can pretty much tell if a guy's got smut in his uh, crop or not, but just by driving by real quick. You can see Cruiser Max Vibrant Cereals here, clean. Now the other thing to know is when it comes to smut, for example, the older the generation of seedlot that you're using, the greater likelihood of you building up smut in that particular seedlot. So it's a good idea to try to turn over those seedlots or get new registered or pedigreed seed every couple years, okay, to, to avoid the buildup of smut in your seed lots, okay? Rhizoctonia. I've always said this is kind of like the holy grail for diseases. Not a lot has been known about Rhizoctonia. A lot of focus has been given to Fusarium, for example, or Pythium, for that matter, or some of the other pathogens. Not a lot of time has been spent on Rhizoctonia, but Rhizoctonia is actually pretty harmful at the end of the day. And this is where Sidoxane or vibrance has a real strong fit, okay? It'll set actually a new standard for this type of control. So basically, I'm gonna give you an example here. We did, tested 157 fields right across Canada because we didn't know a lot about rhizoctonia, okay? Hardly anything, in fact. And we wanted to see what the presence of it was like right across Canada. Now, the key thing to know about rhizoctonia, it's kind of like fusarium. When somebody says, we got rhizoctonia control, well, there's isolates or subspecies of rhizoctonia. There's 13 of them, okay? So if somebody says, we got rhizoctonia control, say, do you have all, they're called anstomosis groups. Do you have all the anstomosis groups? And if they say yes, perfect. If they say they're not sure, I'm going to look into it, make sure that particular product you're using controls all 13 of those anstomosis groups. We're fortunate enough with Sidoxane, we do. And you can see here in the survey, every single field that we tested came back positive for rhizoctonia. And a lot of times rhizoctonia will get misdiagnosed for wireworm damage, poor fertility practices, or even compaction, okay? 
So you can see here the AG or anastomosis group that we saw most prevalently in Saskatchewan was 19. Well, sorry, it was 2-1 for group. And 19 fields we found it. Now, if you're unsure, you might have this particular pathogen in your field and you want to do a real quick test for yourself. Basically, what you're going to do is get two paper bags. One paper bag you're going to fill with trash from the soil surface of that field that you're suspect. And number two, the other, uh, the other brown paper bag you're actually going to use to put live plants dug up with a shovel, including the root systems. Okay? Put it into that other brown paper bag. Send it into an accredited lab that will test for it or identify the pathogen as quickly as possible. Okay? So, for example, once you've taken the plant samples and the trash samples, put them into your um, fridge, and then if you can at all possible, send them away the next day. Don't use a plastic bag, please. That will not, get, not, will not be good. It will end up skewing your results. Okay? So, the other thing to remember about Rhizoctonia, this is a fickled lady. Okay? You can see here on the top, this is our control set of plants. On the bottom, they're infected with Rhizoctonia, AG group 2-1. Particular crops may not show any pathogenic symptoms of Rhizoctonia. They'll act as a host. Other crops actually will show symptoms and will die. So you may not see it year in and year out. I'll give you a particular example. There's a particular grower that's growing derm lentil rotation for 12 years. Never saw a problem on his derm at all in terms of reduction in plant stand, emergence, or anything. But the following year, his lentils always seemed to take a hit. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse to the point where he actually was losing probably in the neighborhood of 20-25% of his plants last year. Couldn't figure out what was going on. So we actually did some tests for him and identified the presence of Rhizoctonia. And you can see here where this uh, little story is going. You can see on the bottom left-hand side here, you've got peas, wheat, soybeans, flax, and on the far right-hand side is canola. All those other crops look good. <coughs> it took out the canola. Okay? So that particular Rhizoctonia AG group, or isolate subspecies, took out that particular crop. But it didn't have a negative impact on the other ones. Okay? So keep that in mind. So for example, this is just a quick snapshot of some trials we did. So Cruiser Max cereals. Works pretty good. As soon as you add the vibrance component to it for Rhizoctonia, it's like night and day. The other thing, Rhizoctonia may not completely kill the plant. Okay? They're also known as a root nibbler. So you can see here, this is my best impersonation of a ZZ Top picture with these roots. Okay? So if you look on the left-hand side, here you've got wheat. With and without sidoxane. Without sidoxane, you see a lot of root pruning, poor stunted plants. Same thing for barley. Okay? So what does it look like in the field? And the reason I'm showing you this is that you may potentially have some of these symptoms in your field that you can't identify, or it may give you some information to think about going forward. So you may have these patches in the field like this. Okay? This is what canola looks like. Okay? So if you've ever seen anything like this, you're unsure about it, and you've ruled out as many possibilities or variables as you possibly can, next step would be test for rhizoctonia. This is what it looks like aerial shot. This particular quarter here pretty much looks like it's been carpet bombed. A lot of dead patches throughout the entire field here. That's worst case scenario. Hopefully you don't have any, see any symptoms like this. Any questions before I move on? I'm going to throw in some wireworm information for you guys real quick too because it seems to be becoming more prevalent. And the reason I say that is now that Lindane's off the market, okay, and we've gone to zero till, wireworms love low soil disturbance. Typically you'll see them when you break up um, sod or pasture land, they'll, become, they'll rear their ugly heads. Okay? The other thing is by us going to zero till, we're mimicking that type of condition. Okay? Now, we're also giving them a food source. We're going in there and seeding. Now, unfortunately, if you're using a Borgo air drill, you'll probably see symptoms like this typically in terms of poor emergence. Okay? I'm joking. We use Morris on our farm. <laughs> I 
I'll go back here real quick. The other thing, wireworms are attracted to CO2. So as soon as you put that seed in the ground, they automatically are attracted to the CO2 production off the germinating seeds. You can see here how they haul the seed out. So it's important to have that insecticide component built into it. These are the other symptoms you can tell. Wireworms versus cutworms. Actually, they're fairly easy to tell the difference in terms of damage. Okay? Cutworms, these guys are very elegant eaters. By elegant, I mean they basically put on a bow tie when they go and sit down for supper. Okay? So what they do is they make a nice, typically clean cut right at the soil surface or slightly below it to shave off the plant. Wireworms, not so much. These guys are hungry, hungry eaters. They leave carnage everywhere. They're very messy eaters. They shred and chop everywhere. Okay? See, so these are just some of the symptoms you can see in these pictures of wireworm damage. This is what it looks like potentially in the field too. Okay, worst case scenario. Now, as soon as you add the cruiser component to it, you clean that up. So you're getting a couple things. One, vigor effect, disease protection, and insect protection with it. Late season. So if you have poor standing emergence, and probably Dave went through this as well in terms of soybeans and corn, what happens is the rest of your agronomic program tends to falter a bit. What do I mean by that? Well, basically, you can see in this particular picture, late season, both sides were sprayed with the exact same herbicide and fungicide package. Left-hand side, poor crop competition, weeds end up coming through. Right-hand side, good crop competition, <coughs> product works the way they're supposed to. Now, the vigor effect. This is another component that you get in, for example, your helix that you're getting with your canola from Pioneer or, for example, that you're getting with your soybeans that are treated with Cruiser Max Vibrance beans as well, okay? And I actually had the pleasure of submitting the data into the PMRA with this and doing a lot of research trials on this. I won't get into the specifics on how the Vigor Trigger works because I don't have time to go through how the different amino acids and everything interacts. But basically, the bottom line is that typically, you'll see cereals or plants that germinate between 8 to 10 degrees soil temperature. What we're seeing here is 6 degrees. We're seeing germination. And as you know, it looks like it's going to be a fairly late year this year for seeding. So every day is going to count when it comes time for seeding. Okay? And at the end of the day, just a fungicide check. The higher rate of cruiser you go, the more pronounced this vigor effect is. Now, where does your, for cereals, for example, where does the bulk of your seed come from? Show of hands, main stem or tillers? Main stem, that's correct. So the more plants you have come out of the ground, the better off you're going to be. Your bonus is with your tillers. That's your, your Phoenix or your Vegas money, so to speak. Okay? Now, because cereals, for example, canola, they all have a determinate life cycle. So the quicker you get them out of the ground, the quicker you get them to senescence or maturity or that 100, 110 days, the quicker you get into the bin. So for example here, you can see just with the fungicide, and this is 2009 wasn't the best growing conditions. 17 bushels an acre. You add the cruiser component, 22 bushels an acre. 20 grams higher rate. What do you notice in terms of percent moisture? At the time of harvest, in a biological life cycle of a cereal plant, what is the moisture an indication of in terms of maturity? Increase in maturity. So you've got less moisture, 13% versus 15. Matured quicker. Just some field trials for you guys real quick to take a look at here. You've got... Uh, 18 and 17 days after planting. Same fields, 56, 27 days after. And I actually have some plants here that I brought along for some studies we've done last year. Um, typically, I'm a, a guy that uh, likes showing a lot of props and stuff, so if I get a second here, I'll probably grab some of these plant samples and pass them around to you guys so you can physically actually see what they look like. Not only does it work on cereals, Pulses as well, canola, soybeans. You'll see the soybeans here in the next series of uh, presentations. At the end of the day, 54 bushels an acre versus 49. 
grade two versus grade three. And you can see the difference in terms of harvesting. A couple days quicker in terms of harvesting. And we've got a lot of acres to do. Every day counts in the fall. All right. Like I said before, a bit of a history buff when it comes to seed care. I like showing a lot of pictures and as well as asking a few questions. So the first systemic fungicide seed treatment, AI, brought to the marketplace was, I even gave you a hint, even gave you a hint, Chemtrua was the manufacturer of this product. Anybody who names it right, I got a little gift for them here. It starts with a C. No, active, A, R, all right, carboxin. First one out there, 1971. And I'll actually give you a hint for the last question. It replaced another product, actually, that uh, was not very, um, it was actually fairly harmful to a person. If you were a kid and grew up in a rural community, you probably played with this stuff in the lab and rolled it back and forth in your hand. Oh, bang on. So you just answered the next question here at the end. You're good. So the other thing that we do is conduct a lot of trials. Coming from research and development, uh, I actually take a lot of pride in this. Because typically what you would see is a whole bunch of data come from South America, like Brazil, Argentina, Alberta, Manitoba, even Europe. And I was kind of getting frustrated with this. So actually what we did here the past couple of years is we've taken a little different direction and said, let's get some local data so that you guys can actually see what it's looking like at the lo local level. Kind of what Pioneer's done for you guys in terms of doing these trials for you. So you have a local feel and you know what to expect um, in your own fields. So for example, the main one to look at here is percent difference. So untreated versus the new Cruiser Max Vibrant cereals in terms of plant emergence, 29%. Versus Cruiser Max cereals, which was the normal standard, 7.2%. And then versus a couple competitors. At the end of the day, remember I said return on investment? Now this is an average, this is a 50,000 foot, foot view for you guys right across Western Canada. We'll drill down to, we did 20 of these trials actually in Southern Saskatchewan, in your guys' geography actually, and uh, I'll drill down just due to time, we'll go through just one or two of them real quick for you guys. So what you see here on average, five bushels an acre, and we did not take out any of the trials this, um, with regards to the had poor or variable field conditions. We threw everything in here. Okay, so this is the full gambit. 2.1 bushels versus Cruiser Max cereals and versus competitor 3.2. So this is down at your guys' level. This is at Saudi, for example. So we conducted a series of trials with vibrance. We wanted to demonstrate what it would do for rhizoctonia control, for example, or smut control or the rooting power component. We seeded it late on purpose, June 2nd. Okay, this is four days after seeding. Seedlings that you saw in the picture that we laminated. If you guys want, go ahead. You can pass them around, take a peek at them. These are the emergence. 201 per 6 meter row for plants, all the way up to 377. Now, I'm going to give you a scenario. I didn't put the slide up here, but several years ago, I was asked to do a correlation in terms of not hitting the ideal 24 plants per square foot for cereals, which is recommended, what it would translate in terms of yield loss. So I'm going to give you a scenario real quick. Imagine you've got, you see two bushels an acre. That's going to equate to 1.752 million seeds, okay, per acre. That'll give you 24 plants per square foot, okay? Now imagine you lose, due to disease, whatever the case may be, 5%. That's 87,600 plants. What does that translate into in terms of yield potential loss? <coughs> Two bushels an acre, before that crop even comes out of the ground. If you lose 30%, worst case scenario, due to whatever the disease, flooding, whatever the case may be, you're losing potentially up to 11 bushels an acre yield potential for cereals, okay? Baraska species, they're able to compensate a lot of this kind of stuff, okay? So you can see here, 201 versus 377 plants per six meters. Big difference. We toured it as well. We did the little things 
differently this year. We actually got the growers to dig up the plants. We didn't tell them what the treatments were. We divided them up into groups, said, here, go dig some plants up. We'll wash them off. And everybody says you got more plants on the, on the left-hand side here. We'll split them out for you. That's what they look like split out. That's what Vibrance brings to the table in conjunction with the cruiser component. Yield. I had an audience like I've never had for yield before. We had 10 growers show up, plus a couple reps as well from the local retails. 28 bushels an acre on treat it, compared to 133, 34. So seed treatments do work, okay? We're seeing the benefit of that. But you get what you pay for at the end of the day. Cruiser Max cereals, 38. Cruiser Max Vibrant cereals, 42. Now anytime we see these massive differences, you guys, we turn them into three-year studies, okay? So it's, we want to verify this is just not a flash in the pan. We do this with all our data, okay? This is an example of a project we turned into three years. So that Clayton Gellner one that you just saw at Southie, we're going to do that three years in a row, back to back to back, to see if we get the same results. So this is 2011. I'll go through this real quick. You can see the same trend with regards to emergence. This is what the plants looked like. Late season. Difference in the field in terms of maturity and yield. 68 bushels an acre untreated, 73, 77 for Cruiser Max cereals, 81 for Cruiser Max Vibrant cereals. Like I said, this is 2011. Anytime you see these massive differences, we turn them into three-year studies. So this is year two. This is 2012. No, this dog isn't what they use down there for GPS. Walks pretty straight though, you can tell. There's no hitch in that one's leg. Same thing, in terms of we saw identical trend. Again, we partnered up with a local retail here as well to tour it. You can see the difference in plants. These are what growers dug up as well. Washed them off, put them on the uh, back of the tailgate, took some pictures. Late season, yield 43.5 bushels untreated. Cruiser Max 53, not as high as the year before. Last, and 2011 was the best crop they've ever had down there. 55 bushels an acre, same trend, okay? Not quite as big a spread as we saw the year before, but pretty close, so two bushels an acre. So the other thing to do is, uh, just due to time, I'm not gonna do a little demonstration that I normally do, but I wanna point out, when it comes to seed treatment, coverage is very, very important, okay? I can't stress that enough. If you want your seed treatment to work properly, you need to get coverage, okay? The old adage where a drop per seed was Good enough? Unfortunately, that's the furthest thing from the truth, okay? So you can see here on the left-hand side, good coverage versus poor coverage, okay? This is what it looks like at the microscopic level. Coming from R&D, like I said, I want to bring a few things different to the table here for you guys. You can see what it looks like on the, soil, on the seed surface here on the far right-hand side when you've got good uniform coverage. Poor seed coverage on the bottom left-hand side just below it. That's what it looks like on your seed. The other thing, a lot of these seed treatments you guys that you will be using right now um, have improved dramatically in terms of flowability, use, everything that I had mentioned before. Now this angle of repose study, it's a real, it's a scientific term, real fancy word, wording with regards to how does your uh, seed flow, okay? And you want to mimic the untreated angle right here. You see this untreated on the right hand side? You see how that cone is formed or shaped, you want to mimic that with a seed treatment, okay? You can see with Cruiser Max cereals, fairly peaked, not quite there. Cruiser Max Vibrant cereals formulation, pretty close, okay? Same thing applies when you've got um, your Cruiser Max Vibrant beans that you're using on soybeans, okay? The other thing is, a lot of these formulations come a long way. Flowability as well. All right, you guys have already answered this question, but I put a little different spin on it. What decade was mercury removed as a seed treatment? 60s, show hands. 70s, show hands. 80s, show hands. 70s. Is, believe it or not, we had it until the 70s as a seed treatment. And I remember as a kid in my lab back in the... The rural school is that we used to play with mercury and bounce it back and forth between our hands just to watch it roll. My wife says it explains a few things. 
So Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans. So you basically got the understanding of what Vibrance brings to the table, okay? Rhizoctonia control, all AG groups in Rhizoctonia, the rooting power, and the smut component. So what is Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans going to bring to the table for you? Same thing as Cruiser Max Vibrant cereals. It's just formulated for a different crop. So you're going to get the disease protection, the vigor effect, the rooting power, as well with it. So you can see here in red the Rhizoctonia component. Now you guys don't have bean, leaf beetle, European chafer, hopefully not seed corn maggot, wireworms, yes, soybean aphid, I saw some in Manitoba last year. I didn't see any uh, here in Saskatchewan, so I think we're pretty safe from that one. So these are just uh, some marketing terms that uh, the marketing guys put together for Cruiser Max Vibrant Beans. The key thing to know with regards to this product is that it's like the full meal deal. Okay, So I remember as a kid going to Dairy Queen and playing hockey. You couldn't wait to go to Dairy Queen after the game. The reason being, you were going to get the full meal deal. Basically, that meant you're getting hamburger, fries, and uh, a Coke. And then that little token they gave you, that was for dessert. You held on to that with your life because if you lost that, man, your day was shot. Same thing for this. You get the full meal deal with this as well in terms of disease protection as well as insect protection, rooting power, and the vigor effect, all built into one. This is what it looks like in the field. This is inoculated with Rhizoctonia for soybeans. Okay? You can see here the difference when you pull the plants out of the ground between just Cruiser Max beans versus Cruiser Max Vibrance beans in terms of performance. What you see above the ground, you guys, the key thing to remember is a reflection of what is below the ground. The brains of your plant are your roots. Okay? So if, you're, if your brain isn't doing very well, the rest of the body isn't doing very well either. Okay? This is just to show you the counts versus uh, in the percentages, Cruiser Max beans versus Cruiser Max Vibrance beans. And this is for soybeans, 103 versus 114. If you're looking at this for cereals, you wouldn't say this is much of a, a difference, fairly small. In soybeans, this is a big difference, okay? The other thing I was talking to about root length and how that correlates to yield. You can see basically, far right hand side, Cruiser Max Beans plus Vibrance or Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans, how the root development corresponds in this particular instance, okay, all things remaining equal, translates into yield, okay? Bigger root system you'll have at the end of the day, better nodulation, more, all that kind of good stuff. Better nutrient uptake. As Dave probably went through, soybeans are great scavengers, okay? Great scavengers out in the field. So the better root system you have, the better they're able to scavenge, scavenge us to say, for nutrients out there, okay? Soybean aphids, I'm, the reason I'm making you guys aware of this, we're just starting to get uh, into growing soybeans. Um, this probably won't be a big issue for you guys. Manitoba, they saw a little bit last year, as I understand it. But if it does become a problem, like I said, full mill deal. Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans works well. And the populations have to get to 250,000 per plant, okay? The likelihood of that happening is pretty minimal. The other nice thing about this formulation, very compatible with inoculants, and Dave probably went through this as well, inoculant, finding the right and the enough amount of inoculant to use to get that good stand is paramount, okay? So just know that Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans does not negatively impact the inoculant because you're going to need two inoculants, a liquid inoculant plus a granular. And if you don't have those and use enough of them, you can have a significant detriment to the impact of either your yield or plant development. Okay? This is just showing you untreated, inoculated Cruiser Max Beans inoculate, just the difference in plants, and development. The vigor effect. Like I said, this is all a segue, all looping together. This is third party. This is done by EggQuest for us. You see the difference in terms of emergence. At the end of the day, soybeans are very sensitive to 
the soil temperature, okay? So basically, you want to get them probably in around 10 degrees soil temperature. Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans gets that seedling moving along as quick as it possibly can to maturity because every day counts with soybeans. This is what it looks like in the field for the vigor effect. Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans versus Apron Max. Give you a little story. Uh, some colleagues down in South America actually was chatting with them last year and they were wondering <coughs> why Syngenta in Canada didn't register the vigor effect first. Where in South America, they have the vigor effect registered first and any other additional benefits in terms of the insecticidal components is a bonus. In Canada, we do things a little different. We've registered the insecticidal component first. Okay? So you can see the difference here just with the uh, vigor effect. That's what it looks like in terms of when you pull the plants and put them in a pail. Everybody says that pail is shorter. If I had that pail the same height as the uh, Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans pail, you wouldn't be able to hardly see any of the beans out of it at all. <laughs> Maturity. As you know, determine a life cycle. And as soon as they start dropping the leaves, as you know with soybeans, they mature very quickly. So you can be there, for example, on a Monday and come back Sunday and say, where in the heck did all those leaves go? Okay? And it could be grass green that past Monday, okay? Or close to it. So they'll mature and drop their leaves very quickly. So you can see here, for example, third party, the addition of cruiser in terms of the difference in maturity. Same thing on the far right hand side. Now we don't put a number in terms of what you can see for increase in maturity. It ranges, okay? Depends on the conditions, but we are seeing consistent improvement in terms of maturity, okay? I've heard some big numbers come out of Manitoba and I don't want to set expectations too high, okay? For those of you that are just getting into it, okay? Because they may be different here in Saskatchewan than what they see in Manitoba or Ontario, okay? Any questions about uh, Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans? Like I said, I just taught, touched on the, uh, the seed treatment portion. I didn't dive into the agronomics, which Dave went through for you guys, so perfect. Helix Vibrance. So that's going to replace Helix Extra with the Vibrance component. <coughs> so this is just the marketing information they put behind it in terms of rooting power. You've got four fungicides now built into it. Uh, systemic, quick acting, earlier flowering pod set, consistent performance under a wide range of conditions, and uh, systemic movement for soil mobility. The other thing is, I don't know if people realize how impactful rhizoctonia can be on canola. Like I said before, it gets misdiagnosed for a lot of stuff. When I was doing the research on this, I was actually shocked how detrimental rhizoctonia can be on young seedlings or even more mature plants, for example. And as you can see here, this is a fairly mature canola plant, just starting to cabbage out. This is what it looks like close up in terms of the girdling caused by rhizoctonia. Here's another instance where we thought actually this was a nutrient deficiency, in particular phosphorus. It wasn't. It was actually girdling taking place at the base of the stem due to rhizoctonia. So this is an example of comparing helix vibrance versus helix extra, and I believe this is one of the pioneer trials that you guys conducted here in Alberta. And you can see the difference in terms of plant counts on the left-hand side and emergence compared to just regular helix extra. That's how much more bang you're getting out of that vibrance component. This is the acid test. I always love showing these particular uh, slides because this is the worst case scenario. If you want to test how well a product works, you inoculate. Okay? So this is an acid test. I hope you never ever come across a field with this much pressure, pressure for rhizoctonia. Okay? So you got untreated check, inoculated with rhizoctonia. Helix extra on the left hand side, helix vibrance on the right hand side. You can see the difference right there. These are the numbers put behind it, for example. Um, won't go through the emergence counts, but the key thing, if you look at the yield, 34.1 bushels an acre for helix extra, 48 for helix vibrance. This is a Manitoba, for example, this particular uh, information. 
Other than that, uh, I've left about 15 minutes for some questions. Thank you very much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Hopefully that information I provided for you guys made some sense and hopefully allow you to ask some key questions to uh, your, either your local agronomist or whoever you happen to be working with on your farm to try to make decisions going forward for your cropping practices. Again, thank you to Pioneer for inviting me. Uh, greatly appreciated. Oh, I do remember one question actually I better answer. With our cropping rotation in this particular geography, planting soybeans on lentils or lentils on soybeans. Uh, that question got asked here. What are the potential things a guy should know in terms of heads up? Okay. We don't have a lot of information on that. Okay. I tried to dig up some cropping rotation practices on this. That is one crop right now in the world that they don't seed a lot of in combination with soybeans. Okay. So we're kind of pi pioneers, pardon the pun guys, um, when it comes to this type of rotation. What I can tell you is sclerotinia, be aware of, okay. The other thing is mold, white mold, same. And then also Pythium, Fusarium, and Rhizoctonia, okay. Those infect all pretty much your pulses, okay. So whether you do it or not, that decision will be up to you guys, okay? However, that is what I know about it. I do not have a recommendation at this point because I do not have enough information. I've been working with soybeans now for about five years, so I'm just still getting my feet wet like the rest of you guys. So I may be only half a step ahead of you guys this spring. You guys probably be two steps ahead of me um, next year for those of you that are putting soybeans into the ground this year, okay? All right. If not, thank you very much for your time. Greatly appreciate it, and um, I'll pass it back over to Rob. Is there, any, is there no Vibrance Pulse product, or is that the Vibrance being like all pulses? Or? Uh, no, we, that, is, that is in the pipeline, okay? We have not got a registration for that. What we have right now is basically Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans specifically designed for soybeans. Okay, so when, whenever you hear Cruiser Max cereals, Cruiser Max pulses, or Cruiser Max vibrance beans, those formulations are specifically designed for those crops, okay? Targeting the pathogens that typically target those crops, okay? So there'll be some unique blends, some unique ratios, and some different active ingredients added to each one of those brand name products, okay? It's not registered, and Vibrance is not sold separately, okay? Just, uh, <laughs> it's a good question. No, they will not not sell it separately. It comes as a co-pack, okay? So you get a separate jug of Vibrance with your Cruiser Max beans. The tank mix the two together, okay, to make your Cruiser Max Vibrance beans. But Vibrance, the straight Sidoxane, will not be sold separately. Yep. Uh, when you were talking about doing your Rhizoctonia test, um, can you submit a bag of trash and a bag of early season weeds? Like if you want to check before you treat your seed? I've never done weeds. I've always done crop that you're targeting. Um, weed, depending on the weed species, will depend on what you're going to get infected with. Okay? So it's probably a better idea just to target your specific crop that you've got. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet in terms of a pre-test, so to speak, prior to seeding that you can do. You almost have to do it on the go so that you can make the course corrections for the following year. Okay? That's unfortunately until they develop new technology that will allow us to do some other type of testing. That's what we can do with right now. Sorry about that.